irony of uh, my timing this with my iPhone is not lost on me, um, but I just want to make sure I keep us on track. And we will take questions from the audience. Also, the ushers will walk around and get the questions. So if you have one, just write it down and we'll try to get to it at the end. Um, I want to start by saying that you point out in your book that you're not anti-technology. Um, but that you want us to be more in charge of the way we integrate technology into our lives. So at what age does taking charge start? Oh, taking charge starts the minute you know you have a new baby coming. Because there's such a tendency to blast the news and to send that, you know, little photo. And it's a it's really a moment of reflection, like how do you want to stay connected to your child? And you made the beautiful point about being present in the moment versus photographing the moment and sending the moment. And we're such an image-based culture now. And we, we experience our experiences so much through photography that I think you have to start very early on deciding who's your primary relationship going to be with, your iPhone or your baby. And then I think there are many things you can do, simple things you can do in the course of a day to make sure you are really with that baby, particularly in the first two years of life, without triangulating your relationship at all with a cell phone. So get up early, a half hour earlier. Check your mail before your kids. This is two for O to five. Before they're up, they need your undivided attention first thing in the morning. And when you pick them up here at nursery school, no baby wants to hear, hi, honey, how was your day? I'll, I'll be right there. I just have to finish this call. You know, it hurts their little feelings. So no phones, when you're with your toddlers, or walking, or pushing a buggy, or at the park, in the swing, they really need you to beam on them. And I could, you know, go on and on, but those are some really important transition moments, bedtime, no How phones. many people in the audience have a child under one year, just to ground yeah. us so that we know when we are talking baby stuff, okay, and then like two to four, two to five, okay, okay so we've got mostly a toddler, Great. toddler crowd, okay. And older than five, great. Okay, so we'll know how high to go when yep. we talk. Um, there was a, a term that you used in the book, mm -hmm. um, the sensorium, yes. which I had not encountered before. And I would love for you to tell the audience a little bit about what that is, and then, you know, how does a parent's use of technology impact that? Well, we have the world's greatest expert, really, about the sensorium, Joanne Deke, here later this morning. But basically, it's the way. A baby's brain develops the ability to process all sensory information. And you only have until five to fully develop the sensorium. And the way the sensorium develops is through playing in real life. It's through talking to you. It's through its ambient daydreaming connection, looking at the lights. There's absolutely nothing an iPad or a smartphone has to offer a baby in developing the sensorium. It's got to be kinesthetic learning. It's got to be relational learning. And the tricky thing about the sensorium, which Joanne will talk about later, is you have until about five to develop this. It's not the kind of thing you can go back at, at seven and say, oops, my toddler spent too much time on a couch playing on a flat screen. We're going to go reboot from earlier development. The brain is a remarkable thing. It really does develop in stages. And what you don't want to do is let the magic of an iPad take away the magic of development from play and personal engagement in real life. So the Kaiser Foundation research, which you cite in your book, says mm -hmm. that 74% of children under age two are um, watching television, yep. right? And that's specific to television, but screens in general, mm -hmm. we, we've all seen it. Um, can those two things coexist? Can the development of a healthy sensorium and, and screens under age two coexist? I think that the best way to think about this is what you want your child to experience under two and certainly under five. Some screen time, a half hour between three and five, an hour at the most is not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you pay a lot of attention, if it's Elmo on Sesame Street, if it's Mr. Rogers. You really want the old educational um, content because the language flow is really slow and it's not full of pings and whistles that, of course, infants love on a smartphone, but it's not what you want to give their brains, that kind of stimulation. It's not all bad, but it's not good. And it's a default. 
It's like what we need to do. Look, I put my kids in front of videos when I needed to shower at five in the afternoon and they would watch movies and stuff. I am no saint here, nor do I think you need to be. But there is a lot of hype that's really devious teaching you things like, oh, this baby app will help your child's vocabulary. Not true, not true. Children only learn language and vocabulary from being read to in real life. So there's a lot you have to understand about what the screen is doing. And kids who watch too much TV, one of the things that's coming through in the research, which of course we've had all of this technology before we've been able to do research, but kids who spend a lot of time on iPads under the age of five now develop such an attachment to their iPad that when they fall or they're upset or they're hurt, they prefer their iPad to their mom or caretaker. And Korea actually leads the world now in treatment programs for five-year-olds who are addicted to technology because they are handed it all the time. So this is a huge experiment on the developing baby and toddler brain with no control group. And we really have to take control ourselves about whether we want this experiment done on our child. There's a line in the book that I carry with me now, um, which is, pick any media exposure as carefully as you would pick a babysitter, mm -hmm. uh, which was a really eye-opening way to look at this. So you talked about television a little bit, Sesame Street being a, a good example of yep. something that's documented actually in, in independent research to have a, a good effect. Um, but when we're thinking about apps, if you were picking an app for a baby, is it um, or not a baby, but maybe a toddler, um, is it that you shouldn't have outsized expectations or are there certain things that you would be looking for? If I were to pick an app for a toddler, I would look at very slow stories that repeat stories I've read to my baby. I'd get the kinds of books they love and get them on tape. Because what listening to a book on a tape or an app can do is it can reinforce the storyline and the narrative. I would stay away from anything like Angry Birds, any, you know, the Baby Elmo version of it, anything that is fast, very stimulating, very engaging, because that creates a preference in the developing baby brain for that kind of fast-paced, quick, pings and whistle stuff. And kids who grow up with a lot of that, we're beginning to see they don't like to listen to story time because it's not fast. You know those jokes about the toddler who's banging a book because it's not responding like an iPad? It's not funny. It's really serious because kindergarten and first grade teachers are saying they're having a harder time getting these five and six year olds to sit still and listen and learn from story time. And they're having a harder time to get kids to pay attention and even to play when they're used to the fast-paced, passive, receiving way of being on a device. Mm -hmm. So moving a little bit up in age to slightly older children, those kindergarten teachers you talk about, um, you mentioned in the book that teachers now and some parents are seeing more from a young age that children are using sarcasm and mm -hmm. stereotypes. Yep. How is that connected to the media exposure that they're getting in the yeah. preschool and early school years? So we know from infancy, babies take in what they see and they learn from what they see. And if they're seeing a lot of gender-based stereotypes in edutainment or just plain entertainment games, um, they're seeing a lot of physical responses to social emotional situations. So boys are seeing a lot of, you know, if you're, mad, if you're sad, get mad kind of stuff. Girls are seeing stereotypical um, body images that are really not good for them beginning at three, four, and five, the whole uh, princess dress up industry. And um, what we see in kids also is the pace at which they're playing a lot of these games, three, four, and five, revs them up and the combined combination of the bad gender stereotypes and the attempt, the hyper-stimulated uh, state of mind that kids get into, things like after watching SpongeBob cartoons are the equivalent for about 15 minutes, children then when they transition to nursery school don't use their better pro-social problem-solving skills. They're more reactive, they're more physical, and they're a little more aggressive. It's just like it is for us, you know, when you're online and you're revved up and you know your tone of voice to your child 
if somebody interrupts you is very different from when you're just scrambling eggs. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, wait a second, honey, hold up. Wait, wait, this is really important. Versus, all right, sweetie, it's okay. We'll get to school on time. We'll find that sneaker. So we too, like kids, are very impacted in how we respond to somebody when we turn from a screen to interacting. So you mentioned in the book that a few years ago you began to notice a change in the way children draw their family. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it had not occurred to me to really look at the drawings with a critical eye. <laughs> so one of the ways we have of really understanding like what it's like to be a two, three, or four-year-old is we say, tell me a picture about your family, or you know, draw me a picture of your family, or let's draw a picture together. And I did some of this research for the book because I really wanted to understand what's it like to be two, three, or four growing up in this digital revolution. And what I ended up seeing and hearing and drawing with little people were pictures of things like, well, here we are on vacation, and here we are at the beach. And there's mommy with her iPad, and daddy texting work, and my older sister with her earbuds, and then there's me all alone. And um, sometimes kids would say, there's mommy with her stupid iPhone. And they would say, tell me stories about how you know, being on vacation was different because it didn't feel enough like vacation mm. because everybody had some device. So the family portrait had a new family member or a new family pet, if you will, <laughs> and it was some kind of technology. technology. And it's interesting because just to back up to the baby years for a moment, you, you do cite research that shows that if a mother has something in her hand, mm -hmm. the baby will reach past a copy of whatever that object is yes. to reach for what mom the has. Real thing. So, and I don't know if they've done any research on dad, but perhaps dad as well. So, sure. you know, that thing that you have in your hand becomes a coveted object really right. before your baby is able to speak. Yes. And, and, you know, babies love what we love. And they will model after us. We are their most important role models in real life. So if your baby constantly sees you picking up your phone, not only will they play phone, now we see a lot of kids <laughs> playing, just checking email at nursery school. I'm just checking, I'm just checking because that's what they hear. But they start to think also that the iPhone, the real thing, is very valuable and precious. So they develop a priority in their own little mind mapping of what matters in life. And um, very frequently, parents told me stories that in their second or third or most recently born baby, often the first words were not bottle or baba or blankie, but my pone, my pone. Wow, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, <laughs> it's really disturbing. Uh, so we can, we can do good things here. There's yeah. a lot we can do. Right, there's hope, Seriously. right. So let's talk about that for a moment. Okay. When you think about protecting childhood, mm -hmm. this idea that children should be allowed to be children longer mm -hmm. than maybe we're permitting them right yep. now, what are the ingredients of that? Ooh, um, well, I think the most important thing to realize is that there's absolutely no app that can offer your child what you can offer your child and what playing can offer your child. Absolutely nothing that technology has to offer a child under the age of five that you can't offer better. And when you think about, let me just use the idea, dress up, favorite game for little people to play. So I interview Annabelle and she's this little five-year-old. Annabelle, what do you like to do when you come home from preschool? Oh, I love to play dress up. I said, okay, how do you play dress up? Well, first I get a snack, and then I get my iPad. And then it's like, you know, click red tiara, or maybe green tiara, or click high heels. And I'm listening to this thinking, okay, this child is not playing dress up. This child is playing a flat screen, one-dimensional game called dress up, but it's a computer game. And she's missing out on the balancing of putting on our shoes, right, or her daddy's shoes, or falling into the dress-up box and creating a story of her own and her own images. And if she gets to play with a friend, the fun of talking, I have the boa, you have the, sh you know, the shield, let's make up a story together and deep play. <coughs> and the most important thing to protect in childhood uh, for your child itself is the capacity to play and to develop a curiosity within themselves about self-generated interest in the world around them and the ability to process the world around them. And the second thing that I would say, which is probably the most important thing 
in terms of protecting childhood is protecting the sanctity of your relationship with your child and the caregivers in her life and the siblings and the people who love this baby. Because when we triangulate our relationships through technology, when you're nursing and on the screen at the same time, you are not connecting to your child or attaching to your child. You have a triangulated relationship. And that's going to disrupt some of the most important kind of ambient aspects of parenting and creating family. So it's very hard. This is not an easy thing because we all have to fight what seems to be a huge tsunami which says technology is great and even for us, and I suffer with this myself, the way we relate neurologically to our little smartphones is they make us feel like everything that's coming in is urgent. It's super important. Oh my God, this might be, something might be wrong. My kid might be, some, right? You know, that feeling of urgency. And unless you're very thoughtful about it, you stop discriminating. Because neurologically, that's how our brains react to a ping. Urgent. That's why we text when we're driving. How crazy is that? Why can't we control ourselves? It's because there's a neurological relationship. And what you don't want to do is have that relationship dominate you so much that you're not protecting the primacy of your relationship with your child and your family and unplugged time mm -hmm. and not buying into the idea of false marketing that all these apps will make your child smarter. One of the buzzwords right now, um, and I think it's, it's something that's you know, been in the research community for a long time, but I think parents are only now kind of becoming aware of this term executive functioning. Mm. Can you define that a little bit and talk to me about the relationship between executive functioning and, and use of technology? Sure. I, I, again, I mean, we've got gurus here. Yep. Ned Hollowell, you know, who's going to follow me, wrote the, the definitive yep. you book. You can give us like the 10 cent tour and then okay. Ned will okay. go in deep next. So executive functioning, the way I would talk about it from my perspective is it's your capacity to listen to the boss inside of you saying what you need to do and actually following through on it. And um, so when you have a child who needs to follow through on things, or as an adult, right, who needs to follow through on something, when you have a good relationship and your executive functioning is strong, you can motivate yourself to say no to things and to follow through on the commitments you've made to yourself or your desire to work and finish the task at hand and not get derailed or distracted. So do you want me to talk about that in terms of parenting or being Well, what's the connection between the use of technology and the development of executive functioning? When we multitask, we are not multitasking. This is not like a competency and an, a higher level of thinking and performing. We are splitting our attention up in three or four different ways. This is a serious, serious epidemic now with kids beginning in middle school. As soon as they can text, as soon as they have a bunch of devices, homework takes so much longer, all sorts of things take so much longer because they are multitasking. They've got two or three screens up at the same time. They see us often with two or three screens up at the same time. And what happens is when you are multitasking, you are training your brain, particularly if you're under the age of 25, to, um, you're sort of undermining the, the development of healthy executive functioning. So you think you're multitasking and accomplishing all these different things at once, but you're not. And let's just say executive functioning is hard enough to develop under normal circumstances. Absolutely. <laughs> so we'll hear more about that, I'm sure. Yep. Um, just so you know, there are question cards. If anyone has questions, we'll turn to audience questions in a few more minutes. So please pass them in. The ushers are collecting them now. Um, the other E word I want people to think about in this context is empathy. Yes. Um, I have to say that you know, I, I guess I never stopped to really think about what empathy is until mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, and then I became really focused on, well, how can I help my children right. develop empathy? Take that one, if you would. Well, one of the concerns about um, uh, this generation of kids growing up in the digital revolution is that research suggests that there actually truly is a decline in empathy by the end of high school and in college. Um, one of the unfortunate, consistent things I heard 18 to 30-year-olds 30, 30 say at the other end of the uh, developmental spectrum is, you know, 
It's so ironic. We're the most connected generation in history. I mean, we can like be in touch with each other all the time, but we're really bad at falling in love. We're really bad at intimacy. We're really bad at just, you know, talking deeply. And that capacity for intimacy has its roots in empathy. And empathy begins with how we are capable of tuning into our infant, our toddler, our child's emotional experiences, and then being smart enough about ours, our reaction, to check in with ourselves about our reaction, but really be present and help the child deal with their reaction. Uh, Donna Wick, who, who runs uh, Mind to Mind Parenting, writes beautifully about the capacity of a parent to check in with their own feelings, but then really help the child deal with theirs, which is different from merging with your child's feelings. Right? You're upset, your baby's upset, so you become upset. That's not empathy. And what we are seeing is empathy begins, it begins the minute you hold that baby and try and figure out, are you hungry, are you thirsty, are you frustrated, are you wet, what do you need? You know, we're empathizing with that baby. And it is such a critical, critical tool and skill for life. And in, in, by five or six, we know that the children who do best in elementary school, who are our best students, and this is true all the way through life, are the children who have the most social emotional intelligence. And it is so much more important to send your child to a nursery school where the teachers are trained to empathize with children, are trained and the emphasis is on relationships and learning together and being part of a community and knowing how to manage your own bad feelings and reactivity. In other words, it's through relationships that we learn empathy. And through face-to-face -face interaction, face, and right? That's just so what that I was by the say. time yep. kids are, you know, whatever age, the texting it and goes. the co-play and Absolutely. gaming it, online yep. club gaming begins, you're, you might be communicating with someone else, but you're not able to see and read their facial expressions. Not only can you not see or read their facial expressions, but you become emboldened to be unempathic. We all know that, that the anonymity of the internet and social networking sites um, disengages, and we know this actually from technology. The more you are engaged in gaming, fast-paced stuff, it can be shopping, it can be looking at porn, it can be any sort of thing. But the more you are in a fast-paced engagement with your computer, your capacity for empathy starts to fade. And this is also why when parents of toddlers are multitasking, it's, empathy involves reflecting feelings, but it's also, at its, if you think of it sort of radiating out, sort of a kind of attunement to everybody around you. So we've seen a 22% spike in pediatric emergency rooms of what's called preventable accidents. Because caretakers like mommies and daddies and nannies are at the park, at home, checking email, looking at your phone. You think you're totally tuned into your child, able to watch everything, but you can't, and you're not. And you don't see that fall off the slide. You don't see that running into the edge of the coffee table in the same way. So screens disrupt our attunement to each other Kids so far cannot learn empathy. A colleague of mine uh, from, a, from an app or, or um, online, although I will say that a colleague of mine out in uh, San Francisco is working on the first computer game designed to teach kids social emotional intelligence and tools. And there are some, there's some research that says kids do learn to be more empathic when they are playing a certain kind of video game with a group like Minecraft when they're doing a pro-social game where they are sharing and helping each other out. So it's not all bad. The trick is to find the rare games that actually reinforce empathy. But it is a critical life skill and you can't fall in love or be a good friend without it. Okay. Um, I have to say I'm a Minecraft mom, and I guess I've seen the pros and the cons. Yeah, there, are, there are some good things there. It's definitely addicting, huh? It is indeed. Um, I was fascinated by how much insight in your book came from your role as a school consultant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is 
New York City is, is such a place to try to figure out the school situation for your child. I'm sure we have parents here who are thinking about ongoing school. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? You have other parents who are new to a school community. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what you would recommend we look for in how a school <laughs> handles technology. Wow. Okay. For the next 45 minutes. <laughs> this no, could, this could kill, kill my career. This is a whole consultant. other. <laughs> this is a whole other uh, so, so, presentation. Yeah, this is all right. So let me just say a couple of things that are interesting. Um, it didn't escape me, and perhaps it hasn't escaped you either, that a lot of the people who develop technology, a lot of the folks out in California, a lot of the people who are really the sea levels in the industry, choose to send their kids to Waldorf and Montessori schools where there is a no-tech or very low-tech approach, certainly through elementary school. And I guess, you know, for, so take from that what you will, right? These are the people who know the most about the effect of technology on childhood, and they are saying, we want our kids in schools that have very low, minimal, no exposure. And I think one of the things that's happening is we are going way too quickly into the idea of one-to-one -one in sixth grade, even earlier. Can you explain what that is for people who are So aren't every there yet? child has their own laptop. All homework can be done on a laptop. All learning becomes screen-based, which dramatically changes, dramatically changes the experience of being in school, of being a school community, and what it means to learn. I think that most schools now, certainly in the private schools, have some tech introduction somewhere between kindergarten and third grade. I don't think there's any reason myself for kids to be doing a lot of homework on screens. It's very complicated because when you prefer a screen and you have to do homework on the screen and then you want to play on the screen, life can become experienced through a screen and that's not good for children, particularly the first 10 years of life. And um, the research is still out on what kinds of learning kids do best on screens. There's clearly some stuff that screen-based learning is fantastic for, certain skill drilling. Kids with learning disabilities, kids on the spectrum. We actually know more about um, the, the uh, specific use of technology for education reinforcement than we do across the board. But I'll tell you a very interesting quick story. I was at a school in uh, the... Southwest recently, and the school went one to one for sixth through twelfth graders. And it's a school where ninth through twelfth grade is half boarding school, half day school, half day students. And after just talking a little bit with the kids and doing some assemblies and speaking to parents in particular, <coughs> the eleventh and twelfth grade prefects from the school came up to me and said, We want to talk to you. We think the school has made a huge mistake giving everybody an iPad. It's changed what it means to be a student here. Nobody talks to each other anymore. The prefects in the dorms said, last year when I was a prefect, I was working all the time. Now I nap. Nobody is hanging out in the common room. I miss the fights we used to have, picking the Friday night movie, because everyone's Netflix streaming into their own room. The sixth graders aren't talking to each other, bumping into each other. Nobody's making eye contact. The school spirit is gone into the screen. So there's a lot to think about, not just learning from screens, but how we connect to each other in real life when so much of education becomes screen-based. And that said, let me say there's unbelievable stuff and ways our kids are going to learn from technology and on screens and in classrooms. They're doing some unbelievable international learning, kids together, the online school for girls. There's brilliant stuff out there. But I would look very carefully at how much is screen time and the flip side of screening at school, tech-based, is you want a school that's teaching social and emotional <coughs> intelligence. You want a school that's teaching social and emotional intelligence, K through eight, very specific s skills about how to relate in person. How, what are the, the skills we need to know how to get on a screen, off a screen, how to speak, how to be empathic, how to de-escalate, how to manage our own reactivity to the stimulation. So I think the schools that are doing the best jobs of adding technology to learning are also adding equally social and emotional intelligence curriculum. And then 
of course, the rest of the responsibility is ours as parents. That's so right. we can't just abdicate and say, well, no. the school's going to teach them. No. Just like we can't say the schools are going to teach them sex ed. We don't have to have the conversation there. Absolutely not. Um, so you define really beautifully in the book what a supportive home environment looks like from a mm -hmm. tech perspective. Um, limiting screen time, obviously, we know is, is part of it. But what are some other examples? What, what else should we be doing? Um, well, I think that it's very important that you have a really clearly articulated family responsible use policy and that's posted. So everybody knows what's okay, what's not okay, when it's okay to be on screens. I think that uh, one of the things that children really need and you need to protect is the ability to play offline. Don't have kids come home from school and play on screens. They really need to come home and play in real life. And the capacity to play together as a family is so critical, especially at your age, because it's in when we play together that our kids feel like they matter to us. And they matter more to us than whatever call might be interrupting us. So really think long and hard about how you divvy up what precious time you have with your children, particularly on vacations. Children really talk about how they get it that mommy and daddy work during the week, but do they really have to text on the ski lift? <laughs> You know, what, I hate it when we're driving on the weekend out of the city and my parents are talking on the blue phone. It's, you know, so when you're in the car with your kids, no phones for anybody. It's precious time. Another thing that's really important is as your children get older and the whole photo thing starts to take place, first of all, limit it. And second of all, understand that young adolescents today are growing up in one of the most unbelievably challenging times because so much of their identity formation and their identity struggles are amplified in pretty torturous ways by all this online, Instagram, photo, image-based stuff. So kids, we're seeing more anxiety, more perfectionism, more social anxiety in by 10, 11, 12-year-old kids because they think they have to look perfect all the time and everybody post these perfect pictures of our perfect play dates, or here we are in our sleepover. Really limit the extent to which your kids do that. Think very carefully before you give them Instagram or let them play it with Snapchat, because you don't want them to have what you said, a photo image-based definition of what childhood should be. It doesn't help them. It actually makes them less popular if they post a lot, interesting. And, um, but most of all, you want your child to develop an authentic sense of who they are, like who they really are in real life, and not who they think they have to be or what they have to look like. And that's something that is, I think, so important for families to do. And you're going to hear later about, you know, actually it, the hard work of parenting, of realizing that this is the child you have. You know, they want to be something you might not want them to be, or they are not the child you dreamed of. And I think that's one of the hardest things about parenting you know, really raising and loving the child you have, not the child you thought you were ordering up or <laughs> getting. <laughs> um, I think we've all read about sort of image management in, in mm -hmm. kids who are applying for colleges or young people who are applying for, for work, but I've heard, you know, pre-teen kids talk about how many followers they have on Instagram, how many likes their picture got, and I, I think it's our job, I guess, to reinforce that that's not where you derive your sense of of worth, self-worth. There's a question here from a, an audience member, um, which I can totally relate to because I too have a fourth grade son. Um, I have a fourth grade son who, according to him, is, quote, the last person in his class to not have an iPhone, right? <laughs> is there an appropriate age at which to get your child a smartphone? Ah, if only it was that easy, huh? Yeah, this, is, this question comes up all the time. So I think the most important thing is to trust your own gut as a mom or a dad. Trust your feeling, your values. Do what feels right to you and makes sense to you. Um, there, if you cave into that request, first of all, even if they are the only fourth grader, which having raised my children, I know, you know, chances are very high, they are not the only one. This is how Ask them to make a list and write it down. That worked in and, my house. And, and also talk to the other parents. Once you give into that in fourth grade, you are teaching your child a great lesson in succumbing to peer pressure. OK, if everybody else is smoking pot, I guess you should too. <laughs> Just bump it up a couple of grades, right? 
So what you really want to be very Only a couple. <laughs> what you really want to be <laughs> careful about is how you make the decisions you make and be very transparent and say, you know, honey, I get it, but I honestly don't think that, you know, let's talk about what's missing. What are you really missing out on? Well, the whole question, should fourth graders have smartphones without restrictions? Absolutely not. This is insanity. This is all of us getting swept away in something that makes more, no sense. More kids are getting into trouble in fourth, fifth, and sixth grades with their smartphones and their iPhones that have no limits on them. I cannot tell you how many calls I get from teachers. We have a great kid here with a great family, and we, are in such we have such a serious situation here. Lawyers, policemen are at our elementary school because of something a child did. So you really want to set limits. The things you want to look out for are, is your child socially isolated? Because you do not want to have a socially isolated child. And if that's the case, if everything is happening, dates, play dates, everything, through texting, then get your child a phone with texting and let it be known that it's linked to your phone. So you see all the text. So you can do the hard work of parenting in the digital age, which means that you're looking at with your child, they know it, don't sneak it, who they're texting, what they're doing, etc. Most of the reasons. I'm just laughing because that's what we're doing in my household. It's not a phone, it's a touch. App, it's great. a text, you know, app. Right and on. Very boy, good. it is a lot of work to read the text, though. It, it is a and lot of And you gotta be work. careful because every now and then you could, you know, send a text to the wrong person by mistake. If mm -hmm. your Apple ID is linked with your child, I'm waiting for Apple to figure out how to yes. have a parental a control ID. They're I'd, working on it. Yeah. yeah. I asked at the Genius Bar, but they're like, call Cupertino. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, really slow it down. Just protect, I mean, just slow it down. Don't get caught up in the insanity. There's also something at that age, I think, to be said for just saying to your child, in our family, we don't do it this Absolutely way. Absolutely right. Not in a way that's judgmental mm -hmm. with, with other families, but right. just that, you know, we don't, we don't think you need one. That's our family rule, and, and leave it at that. Um, there's a good question here. How do you control, uh, yes, how do you control um, the use of and educate, teach your child to control their impulses when we as adults have such a hard time? Uh-huh. <laughs> so one of the first things you need to really understand about yourself is your own wiring and what, where you are really good at controlling yourself and where you are not. And if you can't figure out how to get more in control, New York is full of wonderful people who can teach you some good cognitive <laughs> behavioral <laughs> techniques. Um, seriously, it, it, it's, it doesn't need to be an intensive psychotherapy type thing, but you really have to understand your own reactivity and how to get in control and how to transition well because you need to be able to teach that to your children. And you actually can learn how to teach it to your children even if you're not so good at it yourself. But one of the things that is, is really important is um, to not be a hypocrite. I can always tell at what age when I'm doing focus groups or interviewing kids at school, they've learned that word because they, think, they say things like, you know, we have this rule of home and no one's allowed to use a tablet or any technology at the dinner table, and my parents are such hypocrites. Not only do they both use it all the time, they fight all the time about who uses it more, and it's so annoying because all they do is argue about who's on the stupid iPhone or you know iPad at dinner, and then they get really mad at us when we're just politely texting under the table. <laughs> Um, someone here would like you to comment on Skype. It's a good, good question. Yeah. I had not thought about Skype yeah. as a distinct entity. Skype is a really wonderful thing to do with your children when you're traveling, when you're away, um, but you cannot let Skyping substitute in for um, talking to them and being with them and playing with them in real life. But Skyping is one of the best things to way to actually introduce your kids to technology, to their grandparents who are far away, to their cousins. I mean, that, it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing that children now can have visitations. They can have grandparents do puppet plays for them. They can read to them. They can have a sense of ongoing connection to these people. Some children make the transition beautifully in real life from Skyping with people to playing with them. So cousins will join up instantly with each other. And some of the early research that we're just starting to see, which is fascinating, about language and reading and vocabulary development, shows that if a child is read to on Skype by a parent who they already have a wonderful connection with, or a grandparent, 
more of the parts of the language learning brain light up. <coughs> now that's not the case if your mom is in a TV set or you hear her voice on an audio tape. So what that tells us is there's something about that relationship to someone we love. If, they're not, if we can't be in their lap, it's actually a good thing to Skype and talk and connect. So that's a wonderful use Great. of tech. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, say that you've seen kids in your practice who are truly addicted. Yes. Um, what does that look like, just so we have some perspective? Yeah. So the signs of addiction in early childhood um, are an inability to relinquish technology, a very intense uh, meltdown, and a long time to cool off. Um, children who prefer technology to any kind of social interaction. Uh, children who cannot play anymore with each other. Children who can't play independently from an iPad. Children who look to technology as a transitional object through all of life's ups and downs. It, it becomes like their internalized voice of soothing, except it's technology. And as kids get older, then you want to look at kids who are really sneaking a lot, uh, who are making up stories, lying about their use of technology, who won't play or don't want to play or show no interest in playing in real life. And you can start to see. You can really start to see. And what's so scary about all of this is the brain is so, it's such a little soft sponge. And, and we become what we absorb. You know, Winifred Gallagher rapped, you are, you are what you focus on. So if kids are spending hours after hours on screens, it's not surprising that they develop a relationship to their screens that becomes primary to them. The last question I'll ask, because we don't want to end on such a sad note. Um, but remember, the brain is malleable Absolutely. up until a point. <laughs> um, is that you talk in the book about the idea of the sustainable family. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the definition. This is the, the sort of short version. One that is deeply connected with one another and can bend in a crisis without breaking. That's what we all want to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are some of your guidelines for becoming a sustainable family? Having a lot of time, which in today's world means maybe a half hour a day, if you're lucky, twice a day, where you're just hanging out with your kids. Hang out and talk. No tech. Talk about what happened. Talk about how school is. Listen to their stories. Just be together. Be in, be in the same space together, but not through a screen. And then really find times in the day to, to process with them. So how is school? How is snack? Who did you play with? Did you get upset today? What happened? All those conversations that create the fabric of connection in a family. And use your time on the weekends, and use your time on vacations, and make sure every day, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, you have times where you're just being and playing and talking together. And talk, 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 talk. Talk about friendships, talk about relationships. Let your children solve your problems. Invite them to help you at a young age. What would you do if this happened to you? Because this happened to me, and I kind of didn't know what to do today. Great way to talk with your kids at dinner. I have this problem at work. Can you help me think about it? And then the next day, go back to them and say, remember when you said to do that? That was so helpful. It didn't work. Let's try again. But play together and play with your children at the things they want to do. When you're playing with your children, do not just check. That is a phrase children hate, just checking, because it means you're abandoning them in the moment for something else, someplace else. And, and be the place where children learn how to understand the full range of who they are. Home is where we need to learn how to fight and fall apart and gather ourselves together. There's no way a computer or screen can wrap its arms around your kids or one another when we're going through the daily difficulties of just growing up and the joy and the pleasure of just growing up. The kids who grew up with families that I interviewed, where the parents did a really good job of hanging out 
and being able to talk reasonably and relatively calmly when things went south, which they do all the time. The kids who had the parents who did the hard work of saying no and setting limits and made sure they had family rituals, Friday night, pizza night, whatever it is, those are the kids who really felt well connected to their families. Lovely. It's easy Thank to you. do. Yes. Okay. Resolved, right? <laughs> um, Dr. Steiner-Dare, thank you so much for coming today. I thank really you. enjoyed talking to you. My pleasure. Thank you.